Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. And today I am joined by none other than the Sir Mark Savant the Great. At least that's how he told me I should introduce him. But, but seriously, I am here with Mark Savant, who is actually a podcast expert. He's also the host of After Hours Entrepreneur, which is actually one of the top 1% of podcasts um, around the world, which is pretty pretty spectacular. So welcome to the show, Mark. What's up? What's up? Glad to be here, Deborah. Yeah, it's good to have you here. We've been having a wee, wee chat beforehand, so we've got to know each other. So I'm looking forward to some of the stories we're going to explore. Um I know that you're obviously a podcast expert, but you're actually also a business owner. You employ a team of people. You help other people to build their businesses. Tell us a bit about how you got to be to where you are today because you started in insurance. Isn't that right? Yeah. I mean, I have the history of being an employee. So the transition from employee to employer was about a five-year journey. But I think it all started with just feeling that I was meant for something greater. Like, isn't life more than just waking up at seven o'clock, going to work, coming home, paying the bills? Like, isn't, do did, did you ever feel like you're meant for something greater than that? Because I did. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I mean, how many people just settle, just put on their shoes and just settle and think that they just can't get out of that, tr that track that they're on? It's, it's a really, I think, a sad thing. And I kind of recognized that and I decided... I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to change my life. And I started looking at all sorts of different businesses. Um, I started looking at potentially opening up my own insurance agency. I looked at opening up laundromats, vending machines. I looked at opening up a mattress warehouse. I looked at all sorts of things. I, 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 I just was so hungry to find something. I was even writing and illustrating children's books. I remember some, you know, spending hours and hours and hours in a dark, dank room, just drawing images. And then one day I was like, I can't do this every day. What am I doing? I need, I'm a, I got to get out there. I got to meet people. I got to talk to people. And eventually I, I had this epiphany when I was running, I was like, I'm listening to podcasts every day and I'm learning so much. Why don't I start a podcast? And that was really the moment where my life changed. How long ago was that? Because, I mean, podcasts have obviously been around for a long, long time, but they've only become popular, like I say popular in, in kind of scare quotes in, in more recent times. So how long ago did you start your podcast? My first podcast I launched about five years ago, four and a half years ago. It was called The Awesome Dad Show. But it's funny, I really wanted to talk about fatherhood because I think that fatherhood is a, a really vital part to the world, to the upbringing of our new children. Uh, the, the, the studies are pretty clear that, single, you know, kids that grow up without fathers in their lives have the deck stacked against them. And I said, we need to empower dads to like get involved and to be excited about what they're doing. Like I hated that idea of being Al Bundy or Homer Simpson, that like doofusy dad. I thought that was a really bad way to look at fatherhood. And so I said, well, why don't I combine being active and dad together? The name of the podcast will be Act a Dad. And I was so proud of myself. I put this great <laughs> logo together. It was so cool. It was really cool. I still have the shirts for Actadad. I remember going live and then going on YouTube and being like, all right, let's go listen to the show. Let's go listen to the Actadad podcast. And I typed it in. And I was like, I can't find all that's coming up is Spanish shows. Like, what is this? There's all these Spanish stuff on YouTube. And I was like, oh, it thought I, it thought I was misspelling the Spanish word actividad. So it was auto correcting me. I'm like, nobody's ever going to be able to find this podcast because I try to get too clever with the title. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I had to scrap about 50 shirts that were all logoed. I had to redo the website. I had to redo everything. And I changed the name to the awesome dad show, which you can still find today and will actually pull up when you type it into YouTube. Excellent. So do you still record that? I, I don't, as a business owner, as a podcaster, as a father, as a husband, we only have so many, you can only, 
focus your attention on so many things in order to get the most impact. I really think it's important. I'm reading this book, Necessary Endings, uh, in a in a in a men's group at church um, by Dr. Henry Henry Cloud. And what the book really emphasizes is getting clear on w- your vision and where you want to go, and then pruning the stuff that's maybe not optim optimizing your time. Right. So there might be stuff that you're doing that's either valuable but not optimal, or it's just infected. You got to cut it out, or it's just completely dead, and it's and it's and you're carrying that dead weight. Um, and so I felt like the Awesome Dad Show was a nice rosebud to my my beautiful rose plant, but it, it wasn't optimal. I and so I felt that my time is most optimized by focusing on uh, the After Hours Entrepreneur podcast, mm-hmm. which now has almost 400 episodes. I think we're nearing a million downloads. So it's it's been a real blessing. Nice. Wonderful. And so the switch, I mean, that's, that's quite a big switch from active dad to after hours entrepreneur. So what prompted that? Right. So when I started the Act Dad podcast, the Awesome Dad Show, my goal was even if no one listens to this for a year, I'm just going to put out an episode once a week. I'm going to give it a try. Cause there's definitely, there's definitely a lot of validity and repetition and consistency. That's, that's a real thing. And I really fell in love with it. I was getting some listeners, not a ton of listeners, but I was getting some listeners, but I was speaking to NFL athletes and Super Bowl champions and political candidates, local mayor. I was like, this is pretty cool. I'm getting connected to people I wouldn't normally not have access to. So I kept going with it. And then about eight to 10 months in, people started saying, Hey, Mark, can you help me? start my own podcast. Can you help me with a podcast? Can you help me with media? And so I said, sure, this sounds like a good idea. So I I decided to shift my focus to a new show that was more entrepreneurial oriented because at the end of the day, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to leave my day job that I hated and I wanted to make money. I hated my day job. I I got two kids. I got a wife. I got to make money. And, um, so yeah, I was, I remember this very vividly. The show was ready. I had interviewed probably a dozen people for the show. Right. And I was like, I just need the name. You might remember the act, the act of dad may- mayhem. So I just need an, I just need a name for this show. What is it going to be? Deborah for months, at least three months, I was pacing around my room. I was jogging. I was running. We didn't have chat GPT back then, which would have helped save me a lot of time. I was like, yeah. I just cannot come up with a name. And I remember I was on a road trip with my wife and I was just workshopping some ideas on a notepad while she was driving, um, which is great, by the way, to have a partner who can drive while you work. And I remember I was just explaining to her the theme of the show. And, you know, it's for the the person that just wants to leave their day job and they're using their after hours time as an entrepreneur. They're, you know, they're an after hours entrepreneur. I was like, that's it. That's the show. And then obviously you quickly go to Google, you do all your research. Does anyone have that name? Is the domain free? And to my delight, it was it was open, it was free, and the show was born. Now oh, that's fantastic. I remember a similar thing when I started my Better Business, Better Life podcast um, probably two and a half years ago now. And I did all that searching. But what I actually didn't realize was that um, Better Business, Better Life, there was a, some people spell it or do it with an, a, a, a comma and some people don't. And so later on, I found out there was another New Zealand based company that has exactly the same podcast title. It's like, no, how did I miss that? But somehow because of the way I put it into Google, or it might be, I missed it. So I have the, I have the, um, the demand and I have the podcast, but there was another person out there. So I actually got the guy who runs that podcast to come onto my podcast and he wore his Better Business, Better Life t-shirt onto the podcast. So it was so cool. <laughs> small world, small world. I know, small world. Well, and, and I suppose limited ideas. Nothing is completely new. I love it. After I was an entrepreneur, um, I actually bought a domain name many, many years ago called Before You Quit Your Day Job because I'm very passionate about people. You're absolutely doing what they love, but making sure they're prepared before they actually go into it. Because I think we all have these dreams about, um, you know, we get told you go out into business to get more freedom. You're going to have all this time. You're going to do whatever you want, whenever you want to. You're going to make masses mm. of money. You're going to work from the beach on a laptop and everything's going to be really great. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, my experience is it hasn't quite been as simple as that. So I wanted people to be really well informed before they actually do that. Well, it's, like you, you want, yeah. it's like you want the six pack. I want to have a six pack. I want to have a <laughs> six pack so I can just sit out and just relax all day with my six pack on the beach. <laughs> But what what you need to get the six pack is well I need to diet and I need to work out hard all the time and you know it's kind of the same thing with entrepreneurship I think you could certainly do things smarter 
you know, it doesn't need to be hard, but it can be simple. It, it can be simple. Um, but you're right. What, what I found in the pursuit of taking control of my life and owning my own business was I need to institute habits in my life. I need to cut out the bad habits, like cut out, you know, the TV is out. I'm reading more often. I'm spending time with the right people. I delete all the video games from my computer, you know? Um, but I'll tell you what, I, I, I wake up every day and I'm like, I'm so glad. I feel so blessed to have a life that I have. And I, I, I definitely want it for more people because quite frankly, I think that owning your own business is probably the best way of generating wealth, period. Yep. I, don't, yeah. I don't think there's a better way. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, you know my passion. My passion is about this. Oh, if you can create a better business, then you can create that better life. And that's what I really want for people is that they actually um, don't get caught in the trap of going into business and creating a job where all you're really doing is just doing the work you would do for somebody else for yourself and not have that freedom to do the things that you really are passionate about. So um, tell me a little bit about the journey to, to where you are now. So great to hear that you're doing well. Wonderful that you've got a team of people that you're working with. What was that journey like from just Starting to do the After Hours Entrepreneur podcast, um, helping others out on their journey, and, and and then what? Like, how did it how did it form? Well, I wish I could say it was a smooth drive, a smooth ride. Mm -hmm. It was not. I was working my insurance job during the day, and then I was building out this podcast agency by night. I was recording, and you know, prospecting. By the way, I had no media experience. I didn't know how to develop funnels or lead. I didn't know anything except that I was enjoying the process and people, I was kind of attracting some people. Um, eventually I found, I found a lane. I'm going to help people launch and automate their podcast. I grew out a team and now I have six people with a several that I work with for specific jobs. We're producing 10 different shows right now with a few more. I just had a sale today. So mm, welcome, Jeff. It's going to be great. You have no idea what you're in for, Jeff. It's going to be amazing. And um, yeah, I just feel, I feel really blessed to have the infrastructure, but you know, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not easy. It, it, to me anyway, building my own business required extreme, massive growth, massive growth in myself. And I, I just think that that's a necessary part. You know, we were talking about this a little bit beforehand. There's this song by, I believe it's Mary J. Blythe, where she says, I wouldn't change my life. My life's just fine. And I was listening the other day. I was like, MJB, you got it all wrong. <laughs> y your life is not fine. You can always be better. You can always strive for more. And that's, that's the way that, um, that I approach it. Hmm. That's actually really interesting. So I, mean, I know that I always talk about there's three things we kind of need in life. We need a coach, the personal kind of development type work. We need a, an operating system, which is what I do for my day job. And then we need a peer group that um, I think you can actually tap into. Now, it doesn't have to be a physical peer group, but even just listening to podcasts of people who are going through a similar journey gives you that kind of peer feedback. What did you do around personal development? How did you help yourself to grow? Because we can't do it without help, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, certainly a big part of it was being conscious about the content I consume, listening to the right podcast, cutting out junk TV, starting to read more. I've never really enjoyed reading, but now I read, I read a good amount, probably 20 to 30 minutes a day, at least. Um, all that's been big J joining different mastermind groups to meet new people. And, and that that's been big as well. Um, so all the, all the above, it, it's, it's, you know, one of the things I think that is funny, especially in this field of media creation is being able to look back on what you did a year ago and be like, wow, I was terrible. I was, I was so bad. I was just processing a bunch of old videos because I'm clearing out my cloud drive, another problem, an IT problem that you have to sort out because you're a business owner and you sort out all your problems. And I was looking at these old videos. And I'm like, I could just delete all these because they are terrible. <laughs> They're terrible. And to me, that's a, that's a good thing to recognize the, the gap, how much better I am at storytelling now than I was, how much high, how much better the quality is. I've got a, a, a DSLR camera. I've got two nice lights. I've got sound boards up and you know, just that, I think that for me, just the pursuit of being just a little bit better than yesterday carries tremendous momentum. And, you know, the other thing, again, reading this book, 
I'm going to bring it up again because I'm in the middle of it. Necessary Endings has this point in the book that I think that you really hit on well, Deborah, which is the importance of your inner circle, the importance of the people you spend your time around. There's the point in this book that you only have room in your life for about 140 relationships. And that was kind of like an aha moment for me. I'm like, the, the people that are in my life matter a lot. If I only have room for 140 people, I want to be surrounding myself with people that are going to help me get to my vision. I see my vision. I know where I want to go. I want to be with people that are going to help me get there. And you, you almost have to, I think, audit your inner circle or say, if you don't have an inner circle, how do I surround myself with the right people? I, I agree with you, Deborah. I think that that's probably one of the most important factors in self-development is getting yourself in rooms and around people that are smarter than you, that have done more than you, that can help build you up and lift you up faster. Mm, completely agree. I think it's Dunbar's number. I, I've done some work around this and it's like you've got five people who are really, really close, 15 that are kind of on the, you spend the most amount of time within 150 or the magic number is, for this, but that's the limit of what you can actually do. And it's like you said, I think in the beginning, it's kind of like deciding you've only got that finite amount of people then who do you decide to keep so a bit like deciding that junk tv isn't going to further me so I, these people are not going to help me on my journey they're not going to support me and and being really really clear about who you spend that time with um, it's a fascinating exercise to actually go through and kind of go right so who are the five who are the 50 and it doesn't have to be you know we automatically assume that our family needs to be part of that because they're our family but sometimes you actually have to look at them and go quite honestly you know, mm. are, are these the people that i really want to spend time with on a regular basis or are, are they in the biggest circle of 150 that I'll spend some time with, but they're not maybe the ones I spend the most time with. It's, it, it's, I think that's a really valid point, Deborah. Sometimes the family are the people that need, you need to put those boundaries up because maybe they don't believe in you or they're, um, or they, or they have, they're toxic. They put you down. Um, I'm, I'm blessed that I don't deal with that personally, but yes, that I've seen it. manifest a hundred percent. So yeah. And it doesn't mean you don't love them, but you say, yeah. you know, hey, mom, I love you, but I got to go. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, it, <laughs> difficult. You know, on this idea, though, about you only have a, a certain amount of people that you can connect with, I think about this a lot because as an influencer, as like my, my vision is to have the the best state-of-the-art podcast studio, downtown Fort Lauderdale, minutes from the airport, minutes from the beach, A-list celebrities, entrepreneurs, actors, um, sports athletes, politicians. They're all like, I'm going to be in Fort Lauderdale. I got to get to the After Hours Entrepreneur Studio. I have to talk to their agent. Agent, you got to get me in the studio with Mark. I got to be, I'm going to be in town for a conference. I need to be there. I have this vision, mm -hmm. right? I have this vision. And part of accomplishing that is, is amassing a, a loyal group of followers, right? You need, you need to have fans. You need to have an audience. You have, you have to have people who feel like they're invested in your journey. Um, and so one of the strategies that, that are, that's interesting to me is how can I make them feel more like they're a part of this journey with me? And I, this might sound like heresy, and it's counterintuitive, but I want to bring this up because I've been thinking about it. I think that AI has the possibility of making people feel more connected to you. There's, I was speaking to an AI app developer. I cover a lot of AI on my Mark Savant YouTube channel. And I was speaking to an app developer the other day, and he's developing this app that allows you to basically program a chat bot to sound exactly like you, to speak like you, to use your vernacular. If you're a podcaster, you can already train it off of all the hours of podcasting that you've done. And you can train this bot so that it's an, it's a way for you to, to answer and interact with your fans in a more scalable model. I know it sounds kind of crazy, yeah, doesn't it? I'm going to creepy. It's like, oh, no. Um, and also the big concern, I've always said, I'm, I'm quite happy there's only one of me out there because I don't think the world could cope with more of one of me. Imagine having like, oh, lots of these versions of me. But I hear you. Um, it does give you an opportunity. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure how weird. I feel about that. Yeah. It's a little weird. I don't know how I feel about it either, but I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if you're waking up in the morning, because there's plenty of influencers that do this, like Gary Vaynerchuk, he has a text thread and all it does is it texts you like once a day saying, you know, 
you're awesome, go get it, or believe in yourself, right? So I kind of see it as an evolution of that, but it can be more personalized. I mean, here's the other thing. The amount of data that you're able to get from a single email is astonishing. I was wow. speaking to another right. AI app developer who's developing this calendar app, which is really, really cool. The, the way that it works is, hey, you want a book to be on my calendar, fill out this, fill out this link. And what it does is it, it takes your email, it cross-references it with all the data on the internet, and it does all the research for you. So it's like, for example, Deborah, you, as soon as you logged into the call with me, it would say, from New Zealand, owns a podcast, leads a mastermind group, has, has a cat that likes to hang out in the back of... It, it'll tell me, <laughs> I'll know all this stuff about you, and I never even met you. Hmm. All from your email. Yeah. Isn't that shocking? And yeah, actually, I think Zoom's kind of already doing a wee bit of that. I saw a new app that has been introduced to Zoom where, and I didn't realize, I just clicked, oh, yeah, I'll take it. And it actually sends out, when it sends out the invite, it does, it gives you a whole lot of information. Um, oh, there's a dog in the background now as well. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, there's a whole lot of information um, that it gives you about the person in terms of what it's picked up from just going out there and seeing what else they know about this person. And I suppose, you know, if there is things like videos out there, of course, the internet can pick up the fact that there's a dog and a cat walking around the back of a video can tell you that. So there is such a wealth of information it's um it, it it should make life easier it should make us more connected i just worry that i uh, we also thought that the smartphone was going to actually make life easier and give us more freedom and, and now i see people completely obsessed with them to be fair so am i in some respects i'm not i'm not you know sort of being um, holier than thou in any way shape or form just saying that i've seen a lot of people who just that the, the the reliance on their phone has become huge and yeah, it'll be interesting. <laughs> I think that you could definitely debate that. I think it's a, you could definitely make a strong case that um, that connectivity, specifically, I think with social media, is doing massive damage to mm -hmm. young people's brains. I think you could certainly make the case, not just young people, yeah. but uh, millennials, Gen Xers also, but young people, okay, I think. Can I share particular. something with you? I was speaking to this really amazing, you know, as we said, we meet amazing people in our lives. I met this amazing lady yesterday, ex-military, now runs his um, edge uh, retreats and things, and has done a lot of work around the brain psychology and uh, the physiology of the brain, how things work. And they did some they did some research where they actually videoed adults my age, so we're talking 50 plus, right, who are actually on their computer, and they have their phone next to them, and they would actually record how many times whilst they were working on whatever they were doing on their computer, how many times they'd actually touched their phone. Mm -hmm. And it was something ridiculous, like 50 to 70 times in the hour. And when they went back to the person and said, hey, Mark, we've just finished videoing you and you just touched your phone 50 to 70 times, you'd be like, no, no, I know. It was only two or three times, I'm sure. And then they'd play that, the video, and they weren't even consciously aware of the fact that they were actually reaching over and touching that phone, looking for whatever, you know, the, the, the alert or the announcement or whatever it is. And it's like, wow, this stuff has become so um, inbuilt. And then well, I love technology, so I'm, I'm like all for it. But I, I just wonder how we, as humans, make sure that we we really choose to get rid of the bad parts and keep the good parts and make the best use of it. It's a it's a a big experiment that we're living Ooh. through right now. It, <laughs> yeah. At the same time, though, you know, I focus on what I what I can control, and you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective, from a business perspective. I want to take that piece of information, Deborah, that you just gave me, that the average person checks their phone once a minute, let's say. Mm -hmm. How do I leverage that to generate more income? How do I leverage that to get more sales? How do I leverage that to get more people into my pipeline so that I can engage with them? And, and again, I, I think that everybody kind of understands that. But what I, what I think is the next thing, because I'm always interested in what's next. I think what AI does to kind of bring this full circle mm. is... If I can leverage AI in the data that you're giving to all these platforms, every time you go into a website or to Facebook, or whatever, you're giving them basically all of your data. Yeah. Um, if I can leverage that data and also leverage AI to incorporate my own personality and my own vernacular and the way that I speak, I could combine them together. Well, then I can start to create customized messages at scale via whichever platform I like, whether that's email, which I, I think, which by the way, if you're not leveraging to everyone out there, if you're not leveraging email, uh, nurturing relationships, I'm, it's shocking how powerful email is. I'm just going to put it out yeah. there. 
I underestimate for years. I don't know if you felt like I felt kind of like icky to send out emails like, oh, I don't want to bother people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But people click. Yep. People click and they buy. And in and, and it's in it once you start getting your formulas down and your numbers down, it's like, whoa, this is this is actually something. This is, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's actually negligent not to be sending out emails and building out your email campaigns, but I'm getting way I, off I was topic speaking, here. I was speaking to an email expert who had exactly the same thing. And I think I think maybe what happens, this is my, my theory on it, is that um, there are a select few who kind of ruin it for everybody. And so uh, LinkedIn is a classic example. It's like there's, those people who just connect with you and immediately kind of just throw shit at you and want you to buy <laughs> things. And you kind of go, ooh, you haven't even asked me how I am or asked me what I do or anything. And so um, because of that, I always felt like I never wanted to message anybody on LinkedIn because I didn't want them to think I was one of those horrible people um, that was going to just throw stuff at them and expect them and then I realized no good good people don't do that and also there is some there are some good ways of doing it on in a more automated way but without losing the human element that needs to come with it because you don't just you know you don't walk up to a complete stranger in the street and go hi I'm Deborah Chanchi Taylor I'm a professional EOS implementer I work with this is a blah 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 he's started my clients so you should have a look at their websites yeah you just wouldn't do that <laughs> and then we suddenly think it's okay to do it on LinkedIn so um click here I to think, call for a call <laughs> yeah, that's right yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that's uh, I, I think you're right I mean email is massively underutilized and I think people are looking for connections and they're looking for their tribe and they're looking for the people that they can be involved in. So if we can use technology to, to make a bigger impact, that's awesome. Yeah. And you know, I, I, was, I to, by the way, I totally agree. The LinkedIn DMing that people do is a cesspool. Like <laughs> if, if you're sending a link within your first message, you're, you're, you're failing, but I, I, I am empathetic to, the pitches because I understand that a certain percentage of them work and they're the person is just trying to figure out their formula. They're trying to figure out how to fill their, their funnel and their lead. So I'm empathetic. I just, someone just friended me on Facebook. I was like, this looks like an interesting person. We are, we have mutual friends. And then within the half hour that I friended him, he tagged me on a, on a post with 36 other people. And I was, and I messaged him. I'm like, Please I'm don't. like, it's, it's nice to meet you. You seem interesting. But you know, I'd appreciate if you don't just spam tag me in posts. And he was like, "Okay, that's cool. Tell me about." You. And so we actually had a real conversation. But uh, you nice. know, I th- I think I think that's important. But you know, it, it, yeah. It, at the same time, I I think you know one of the things that's great about the AI type of method methodology here is everyone has you know like any big business has a sales team. Right. Mm-hmm. And why do you have a sales team? You want to have someone that does the, your, your outreach, warms people up so that you can close. Yep. And I think of AI as serving that serving as, as kind of like a salesperson at scale so that you can close. And, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you that I'm studying it, learning it and, and focusing on how I can implement that the right way. Because once you figure that out, you could just that you could start to really seriously move move your mm. your um your income yeah and also move the impact you're making which i think is really important so that I, mean, I completely agree and i think that um i say so i'm an early adopter of technology much as i kind of you know cringe and kind of worry about it i, I mean i was um, the first kid on my block at 11 years old to have a computer and this is back you know i'm a bit older than you i'm assuming so i'm this is way way back when there were no home computers so i've always been that early adopter the person who has all the stuff i you know i've got my remarkable that i use i've got my i've got every single piece of technology that is out there and i think ai is absolutely phenomenal in terms what it can do this afternoon i got it chat gpt which i know is not ai but you know it's part of it i just wanted to launch a new i just finished a, a series this morning around um business growth like an in-person in-person workshop and i wanted to get the next one set up immediately so i thought okay i'm just going to ask it to tell me what i should call the next title and what what kind of topics we should do oh, and yeah. what we should write on our copy and within like literally two seconds it was done and now i just go you know i flick it off to the the va and kind of go please make up the next website please make this all happen this is what we're talking about just just do it and i mean that stuff is phenomenal and that you know chat gpt is just the very very tip of the iceberg there is so much that ai can do yeah it's amazing. And I'm with you there. I, I love technology, but I also have some serious fears. I'll give you another example of a serious fear is a uh, deep fake technology, deep fake, meaning you're able to s- 
put someone's face on someone else's body. Yeah. Right. Uh, you, if you saw the new Indiana Jones movie, they kind of like deep faked Harrison Ford onto the, the main character there. Um, well, there is uh, on, on one level, I think it's really cool in that example, or there's this, uh, there's this Instagram of like a fake Keanu Reeves where they just deep fake Keanu Reeves face onto people doing, you know, just kind of like very mundane things like making eggs or something. Right. <laughs> funny. Cool. You're, yeah. you know, it's pretty, it's pretty funny, but there's a really dark side to the deep fakes. There is a, a very famous Twitch streamer whose name escapes me right now, but she rubbed someone the wrong way. And what this person did was they took her face as a deep fake and put it into pornography. Oh, and yeah. she was d devastated because she didn't sign up for that. She never consented to having her face distributed in pornography all over the internet. And you know, what's going to happen is because this is stuff is not difficult to make is this becomes more and more easy to make. You're going to be, I have a six, seven year old daughter. She's going to walk into school one day, knock on wood, and she'll have gotten to a fight with the wrong set of girls or broken up with the wrong guy. And then everyone is going to be laughing at her in her face because everybody watched the video of her doing the thing with that person or that animal or that whatever, you, mm. however twist your mind can get. <sighs> yes, I can imagine. And you're going to need you know, our youth, and I, this is, I think the most important thing that I, I pinpoint with my, with my kids, you're going to need to be strong in here, in your heart, because you, the, the amount of abuse that our young people are going to take externally in this world where everyone on Instagram is a perfect hundred percent, perfect specimen of a human being, perfect face, perfect body, tons of likes on everything. And you're just you they're going to be devastated. And then you just, the, the, the defects take to the next level. So I, I really tried to emphasize with, with my children, it's got to come from inside, yeah. you know, in, in words of affirmation, exercise, surrounding yourself with, with the right people. Um, that's, that's what we try to stress. I, that that's the type of thing that terrifies me is, is how it's going to impact my children. Yeah. But the reality is, I mean, it is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. And so we have to actually look and go, okay, how do we minimize those kind of risks and what can we do to tap, to make the most of it? And I mean, I know that it certainly is changing the way that podcasts are being done. And um, I think there was, there was a piece of software that I just tried out the other day. And, you know, I think I uploaded a, a podcast to it. It immediately took snippets from the podcast. It took, it gave it a title. It put all the, the, the words underneath it. It even prepared an email to send out to the people um, that are on my database about the latest podcast. And a whole bunch of other stuff that I actually didn't didn't get into because I don't I don't get involved in that. Um, this actually goes to somebody else to do all that stuff too. So I don't know who does it or how it gets done. But I just wanted to try it because I love trying new things. And I mean that's a, that's a game changer in terms of um, you know being able to do things that quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I just you know I just said I just completed completed an entire copy for a website in in two seconds flat. In in one press of a button I can launch all this stuff. But what are the what are the what are the pros and what are the cons of that? As you've alluded to, there are many, and we haven't even begun to scrape the surface. I mean, this is something that, you know, being in the United States, we're in the middle of this kind of like heated uh, uh, presidential election, and there's a lot of topics that are being talked about, you know, the border, education, the economy, all this stuff. I have not heard one person talk about AI and the threat to not only our social well-being, but, you know, you could start to look at the, the future of warfare. We're all kind of worried about nuclear bombs. What about AI just running rampant in, within all of your IT systems, mm. right? Or drone swarms of millions of AI robot powered drones bombing your city. Like, anyway, I, we don't need to go okay, that thanks route. Thanks for that. Yeah, please don't let us go down that route. <laughs> but how is, I just don't understand how not one, no one has even talked about it. it it's the World yeah. Economic Forum has, has, Estimated 80 million jobs displaced within the next several years. Walmart planning to automate 63% of their stores within two years. And we're not talking about this. I, it just, I don't know. I, it, it doesn't make sense. It seems like our priorities are maybe off on, on how monumentally transformative AI is to every way, shape, and form of life. It's, it, yeah. it's kind of shocking.
Hmm. But I think it has huge potential because, as I said to you before we got on the podcast, I think that if we can actually – we talk about delegating and elevating to your unique ability or God-given talent, right? And so what do you really love and you're really, really good at? A lot of the stuff that AI does is certainly not stuff that I love or I'm necessarily good at. So I'm really happy to be able to give that stuff over to free myself up to do the stuff that um, I think may, I, AI probably can never do. So facilitation of leadership teams, I can't – imagine i could yeah. be wrong but i can't imagine how ai is going to come in and do that kind of role but that's something i love and i'm really good at so um if we can use it in a positive way to to eliminate the mundane stuff hopefully my hope at least is that everybody on this planet gets to do stuff that they actually really love and are really great at 100 percent. and like we we talked about in the beginning it um it's 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 going to help us eliminate all that boring stuff right mm -hmm. We just need to find a way to make sure that people are motivated to actually keep up and learn and find, you know, we talk about Walmart, you know, retail, retail cashier is the number one job position in the United States. Well, what happens when all those go by the wayside? What do you do now? What are the number one jobs? What are the new skills you can be learning? So anyway, I, th I think it's relevant. And you know, AI I talked to, I like to, I mean, AI is so fascinating. I talked about some of the scary stuff, but what about how it can just take in trillions and trillions of data points, put them all together and solve problems. You know, you, there's a lot of talk about the climate changing and heating and cooling and all that complicated, very complicated. Like one small beetle dying could mean an entire forest goes down because it can't eat the parasite that infects the trees. Right. Well, what AI can do is it could take in, all that data and kind of process it in a, in a way that just isn't possible for humans. So I think there is the possibility for a lot of good. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Okay, so um, gosh, AI, yeah, that's, that's a topic we could go on forever. Uh, I want to talk a bit about podcasts because that's obviously your expertise and, and we've talked about the fact that you've built a business around it. Um, I'm feeling awfully, awfully embarrassed at the moment being in my home environment doing this podcast because I have a beautiful I have a beautiful podcast studio in my office that has got all of the soundproofing and the, the best microphones and a beautiful DSLR camera and lighting and everything. Um, but to be honest, part of being an entrepreneur for me is that sometimes I just don't want to go into my office Office. And today I was out doing a, a workshop and I thought, I don't want to go back in the office. I've come home. Um, but I'm, I'm here. I think hopefully the quality is not too bad. We've got a few cats and dogs that are making it a bit more interesting. What's the biggest mistake people make um, when they decide to launch a podcast? I think the biggest mistake is waiting for the perfect conditions. Just like I, I gave this example at the beginning, I was I spent so long coming up with the perfect name, Actadad. That was the name. My website was perfect. My show was perfect. My show art was perfect. I paid the, for the logo. I did, everything was perfect, except I couldn't rank it on a ham sandwich. It was just never going to rank. People couldn't find the show. And so I, I think that a lot of times we're just waiting for everything to be perfect. Well, you know, once I have more time, then I'll do it. Um, I had a friend a few years ago that was, t he saw what I was doing. He's like, wow, that looks really cool. I would love to have a YouTube channel. Oh, man, I would just love to have this YouTube channel. So, That's great. What would you, what would your channel be about? You've got a phone. You can have a YouTube channel. You got a phone. And he's like, oh, it would be about the outdoors. I love the outdoors. He's from South Africa. I love, you know, talking about the outdoors and, and whatnot. And I was like, cool, go start your outdoor YouTube channel. He's like, well, I can't do, I need to get a kayak first. Once I get my kayak, then I could start my YouTube channel. That That's when I'll start it. Get, spoiler alert. He still doesn't have that YouTube channel. No. I call it the hamster wheel. It's kind of like, you know, if you said, I don't know if you've got hamsters in the, in the US, but we used to have them in the UK. And we used to put them inside these little plastic balls that were clear and they would basically run around and, you know, they just run around and around and around and around. around. And it's like in life, I, the hamster wheel is like, you know, when, when, when I get this, when I have that, when I do this, when it's like, you just be, keep, everything just becomes, the, once you've got that, you're waiting for the next thing. Like, why can't we mm. just get on with it right now and be grateful right now for what we've got? Yeah, yeah it, I, it's, it's, it's a human condition, I think, to say, well, tomorrow. And sometimes <laughs> the, the answer is not now, sometimes. <laughs> but I think when it comes to podcasting, the best thing to do is just start or you know, work with someone like myself who can make sure that you get off to the best start. But the biggest mistake people make is waiting for perfect. It just never comes. 
Hey, look, when I first started my podcast about two and a half years ago, I mean, I literally went out and bought, and I'm talking about New Zealand dollars here. So this is like, um, I don't know, but really, really tiny compared to the, to the American dollar. I went out and I bought like $50 microphones on stands I could put into a room and I just invited my friends and I've got, I'm very, very, very fortunate and grateful to have some amazing entrepreneurial friends who've done some big things over here in New Zealand. And I just invited them in for a chat. Um, and I had no, I, I just, you know, I just thought it'd be fun to have a chat to them. Um, and I did it for about a year and I got to the year and I was doing it every single week and I was really enjoying it but I kept looking at the numbers and I was like oh, you know why am I really bothering doing this and I, I came this close to kind of giving it up because I thought I just can't see how this is ever going to really have the impact that I want and then it was um I, I, and so I was this close to giving up and then I suddenly actually had somebody give me some feedback and they said, I love listening to your podcast. I've got so much benefit. I've listened to it. And I thought, hey, if I can actually just affect one person, that's kind of cool. And I enjoy doing them. So I'm going to carry on doing them. Um, and so then I upgraded my equipment sort of slowly and surely and just kept on going and kept on going. And it really wasn't about until about the two year mark that I finally got more listeners and it started to actually grow on a consistent kind of way. And then just about, I oh, must be about two months ago, I was in an airport in Melbourne, different country Australia and somebody ran up to me they go are you Deborah and I said uh, yeah do I do I know you I think oh gosh I've forgotten who it is it's a client of my way I haven't got this gone wrong and she said oh um I've been listening to your podcast and I just love it and I thought oh that's it I'm never giving up my podcast now <laughs> and um, whether I'm you know it may not be it may not be reaching the millions of people but it's certainly thousands and they people are getting value from it so yeah that is the be that is the best when someone you've never met before just taps you on the shoulder. That, that <laughs> same thing happened to me at a conference a few weeks ago. I was having a conversation. Gentleman walks over. Abraham taps me on the shoulder. Says, Are you Mark? I love your podcast. Just, I was like, dude, it's so good to be. Yeah, it's the best. It's the best. That hundred percent keeps me going. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, more of that. But yeah, so but, but I do wonder because you know there was that point when I was very very close to giving up. Um, do you have any clue how many podcasts actually continue on into the long term? Because I think we're I don't know I'm talking episode one hundred and seventy or something. Um, how many people give up too early, too soon? Well, there's there's different data points. The vast majority, I would say ninety percent, uh, are quitting before the seventh episode. Wow. And, and so while there are millions, I, I think the, the last number I saw was something like 3.5 million podcasts are out there, huh. but the vast majority are not, they're not active. So uh, again, you have to forgive me the, the exact data is not clear somewhere around 300 to 400,000 active regularly produced podcasts are in syndication based on the last numbers I've seen, right. but you know, you don't need to, I mean, I think sometimes we, it's not just about how many people are downloading your episode, mm -hmm. right? Because the way, the way I see it is the podcast is the engine for your entire digital presence. It's your networking, it's sales, it's lead gen, it's access to people you might not normally have access to, yeah. presidential candidates, celebrities. Like you don't get access to these people unless, unless you have some sort of media uh, or, or, or platform but it's not just that it's now I have all the social media content I need. Now I have the, the, and now I have the gasoline for my blog on my website. Now I have YouTube. Wow. This is ha helping my website rank. This is giving me SEO. Now it's an e So that just because just by recording with an interesting person for 30 minutes a week, now you've all of a sudden built out your entire digital media presence. So quite frankly, even if you have a podcast, it's only getting zero downloads, it's still a valuable asset because of all the other intrinsic things that that come as a result from it. But spoiler alert, you're going to get more than one downloads because, mm -hmm. you know, yes, you're, you're, you're stick, interesting, yeah. you stick with it. You know, yeah. Actually, that is really interesting because um, that does require some work and some strategy to kind of build that. I, mean, I completely agree with you. It absolutely gives you the assets for a whole lot of other stuff as well. But is that what you do when you're working with clients is to make sure they fully maximize the impact that that, that podcast um, recording can actually do? That's, that's exact. That's exactly. That's my bread and butter. I help business owners launch and automate their podcast. So we put together a strategy within six to nine weeks. Your show is live on YouTube. It's live on iTunes. Um, we, we launch with 
lots of clips, those, you know, whatever's highest performing at the time, you know, typically it's vertical short form. Uh, we try different sorts of carousels and graphics and yeah, we just turned that. If you can record a 30 minute zoom call, you can have a massive digital presence. And that's, that's what we focus on it at my agency. So now there's my, there's a question I was going to ask you. I think you've kind of already answered it. So you keep talking about 30 minutes. Is that the ideal amount of time? Cause I, I originally sort of said I wanted mine to be 20 minutes so you could actually have it, you know, listen to it in the car. But sometimes I just really enjoy talking to my guests. So it's like, okay, we're going to talk for more than 20 minutes. <laughs> but what is the, the optimal amount? Is there a special, is there a special number of minutes that is, you know? So it, right? it depends. It, so the short answer is it depends. It depends on your goals. I think it's best to experiment with different lengths. And it, it, again, it depends on your audience. You know, for, for example, I speak to entrepreneurs, to business owners. A lot of entrepreneurs don't just have three hours to listen to a Rogan style podcast. But if you can give them 15 minutes of like really condensed, really useful information, it's a much easier sell. It's a much easier way of getting people in. So I, I tend to vary anywhere between 10 minutes. I do like 10 minute solo episodes. I do my monthly income report. Uh, I, I train in, in kind of talk about how I'm using AI. So I've tried to be a full, fully open book. Um, but I'll, I'll range anywhere from 10 minutes to two and a half hours. So, you know, to answer your question, Deborah, there's no one right way to do it. Right answer. Yep. It, it, uh, but it I do like what you just said there. I, I think you've just said that you know that it's not just about. Um, so most of mine are interviewing people because I just really enjoy that. But I do also do some solo episodes. I do also um, repurpose other other talks and things that I've done, and actually bring them onto podcasts as well. And it is fascinating. Like you start watching what people actually do, download or listen to. It is really interesting to see what appeals to them. The stuff that I sometimes think is the most boring to me because it's me talking about my shit, and I kind of go, "Why would anyone listen to that?" And then people really like it. So it's like, okay, well. <laughs> Do a bit more of that. Um, moving away from podcasts for a minute, what's been your biggest challenge in growing your own business? So going from you know being an employee to to being what would I'd probably originally be a solo entrepreneur with a few contractors to now actually having a business. What's been the biggest challenge for you? I would say the the biggest challenge in building, building my business has been, I hate to say this, but uh, isolation in a way, I think, because, you know, my wife is awesome, very supportive, but she doesn't full, she doesn't understand the challenges that I'm going through and landed this client, this tech broke down, lost this client, this team member fell off. There's an emergency in the Philippines, uh, you know, all these different things that happen. So, you know, she, I, I can't really, you know, she doesn't really fully understand that. Um, and then I go to my friends and, you know, my friends are, they're, you know, playing video games or they're drinking. They're just, they're very content with, you know, with where they're at. They're not, they don't, they don't, they don't really see the world the way that I do. Um, and so I, I really felt like there was a sense of, of isolation that, it, it's it's just me. And even though we live in this world where everyone's connected on your smartphone, you know, not really. It it's it it doesn't really feel connecting, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's kind of funny. I was at a conference a few weeks ago and we were doing this workshop on uh, identifying your opportunities and your leaks right? Where, where are the leaks in my business? Where are the opportunities? And I recognize that I have a huge leak. I don't have an inner circle. I don't have a tight knit group of people that are all invested in my success. And so leaving that event, I, I spoke to all, so I run a, I run a mastermind, the after hours entrepreneur mastermind group. And we had about, I don't know, 25, 30 members in there. And I said, Hey, I want to do something that's more focused. I want to have you're here every every week, once a week for one hour. We're going to set goals. We're going to be accountable to each other. And once a week, we're going to have someone who sits in the hot seat and everyone is just going to focus all of their energy, their resources, their network on that person so that, that person can solve that problem. And uh, honestly, it's 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 been tremendous not just for me personally kind of experiencing that and it, it, even though it's in its infant pages stages, but as I go around and I start talking to other people, other entrepreneurs, everybody feels the same way. 
Yep. I was like, I'm not alone. Everybody has this gap. And so I think that finding your tribe and finding a, a close knit group of people that can pour into each other, that I think has been the greatest challenge. And I'm, I'm five years into being, you know, to doing this, I'm, I'm finally coming to that realization. Like I can't do it alone. Frankly, I don't want to, it's, no. it's harder. <laughs> Uh, no, and I agree. And I think that's why things like, you know, entrepreneurs organization, EO, entrepreneurs organization, your Vistage groups, your uh, mastermind groups, all those things actually give you the access to people who are going through similar experiences to you. And, and you you find people that you can actually open up to about things that, yeah, as you said, I mean, my husband's an actuary. He works for an insurance company. but He knows nothing about running a business. And, and I, I remember losing a client a few months ago and, and they booked in two days. And I get paid by the day. So they changed the, the, the they cancelled the two days like a week out and it was devastating from a financial perspective from a mm. uh, why have they not why do they not want to work with me perspective all that stuff um, and he doesn't get it and he was just really annoyed that we'd lost the income and it's like I had more than that going on because I was going well these are one of my best clients and why did they do that and am I not doing my job well and all that stuff that goes on and so by having one of those groups you can have those conversations and I think it's absolutely invaluable yeah and you know to that point which by the way, shot to entrepreneurs organization. I'm going to be hosting a podcast booth in Tampa in October. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll awesome. see you there. Yep. But <laughs> I think what's even more so important than finding like a big tribe is fine is, is, is cause I've had that before, but I think it's having a tight knit of people that I trust and they trust mm -hmm. me. And we're, we're, you know, the iron sharpens iron that I think has been the main, the big thing that I've been missing is, I want 10 to 12 people that are all really focused on each other's success. Um, you know, so so, so maybe it's not the same in America, but certainly over here, uh, EO has their forums. They've got their big learning days and it's a big sure. organization. They have their forums that basically have six to eight people in them. Um, you all come from a different industry. So therefore you've got, you can really frankly and openly share everything that's going on. Um, and that's where you get that. So that's, I mean, I remember in my, in my forum, I had um, six guys and myself and they're like my big brothers. Like they were just, they were there for me no matter what was going on. I could talk to them about everything, anything and vice versa. Uh, you're right. Mm. It's just, it's what we need because Sometimes it can be tough, right? Very tough. And, you know, we talked earlier about you can, you only have enough room for 140 relationships at most. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're not, I, I audit the people that I spend time with much more closely now than I used to. Yeah. I, I am very, I'm very intentional. You, you have to be able to say no. Mm. You just have to be able to say no. Um, yeah, I don't know else to say it. I was invited yeah, to join a kickball group recently, and all these people, like, they seem like fun people. They're drinking beer, and they're playing beer pong, and they're hanging. You know, they're fun. Hmm. I'm like, I'm I'm meant for more than this. I'm meant for greatness. I have that vision. I have that premium, state of the art podcast studio in Fort Lauderdale, five minutes from the beach, five minutes from the airport. Celebrities, a list entrepreneurs. Pro athletes, politicians are flying in just to see. That's the vision. Yep. And you, there's no way I'm ever going to get there unless the people that I'm surrounding myself with are facilitating that vision. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I could see, I can see it, Deborah. I could see it so vividly. And I can't um, wait till I come to that studio and do a, a session with you. <laughs> oh, it's going to be awesome. There's going to be, you know, we're going to have an awful audience and it's going to be, you know, a bar and a cigar lounge and I don't drink, but it's going to be amazing. And I, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and exactly you know, if you have doing. a big vision, you need to be yeah. with the people that support that. Yeah, yes. Cool. Cool. Right. Okay. So let's get to the media stuff. Let's get to the, so your three top tips, you've already given lots and lots of value so far around the things that are important, but if you had to give three things that you've learned on your journey that you really think would be helpful, so it could be top tips, tools, books, whatever it might be, what are the three things you would share with the listeners? Okay. Um, so I, I give top three books that, that changed my life would be four hour work week, Tim Ferriss, Really important book about outsourcing and scaling up your time. Um, Atomic Habits. Really love Atomic Habits. That was a great book. James Clear. Amazing. Mm -hmm. you, you need to have the right habits in place. That book is great. Um, $100 million leads. Alex Hormozzi. Awesome book. Yeah. Uh, Story Brand. Donald Miller. Awesome book. Yes. Great book. Yep. 
you know, I'm just starting on necessary yeah. endings. Now this is a great book, predictable <laughs> success. Great book. Just read that one. I have Think and grow rich over here that I'm just, that's actually going to be in our book club for October. Yeah, My book club fabulous. is going to be reading that book. Um, so I think, you know, rich people read poor people scroll. Hmm. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yep. So that that's one, um, two, you need to be using AI now. Yep. You, you just need to be using AI. I don't know where it's going or the exact ways that it's, it's going to work for your specific business, but you need to be using AI now. It's going to change your industry dramatically and you want to be first in line. And A, mm -hmm. you also want to be vocal about using AI because then you're positioning yourself as a, as a forward thinker. Yeah. Um, I think I, I mentioned to you before we came on the podcast. So, I mean, I was one of the first kids um, to ever have a, a home computer and that was when I was 11 years old and I'm 53. So there, there weren't home computers back in those days. And I tell you what, um, I taught myself to program. I kind of taught myself to get very comfortable. What, it, what I learned more than anything was adopting it really early. Man, I never had a fear of computers, never. Like I would just wow. hop on any computer and I'd just give it a go. And I know that everything can be undone within limits and, and you just need to give it a go. And I think that's the same with AI. I think we need to jump <laughs> Jump on board, learn as we go, and just get comfortable with it because it's going to be here um, forever. Um, it's going to change all the time. And if you're not comfortable with it, that's when you're going to have the challenges, right? 100%. If you don't know where to start, just use use ChatGPT for 15 minutes a day, mm. 10, 15 minutes a day. If you don't know where to start, just start there. It's yep. very simple to use. Um, yeah. You, if you're not using AI, it's going to be like you're, it's like you're in a race, you're on roller skates and the other person's in a Ferrari. You will not win that race. So you need to be experimenting with AI now. Cool. Yep. Okay. And the third and final. Third. There's so many lessons. Um, I think for, for me, and I've, I've mentioned this a couple of times is having a clear vision of where you want to go. Yeah. And what you want to accomplish, I think, is important because mm -hmm. with, without a clear vision, it's very difficult to determine next steps. It's, it's oftentimes, you know, when you show up to a nine to five job, it's not complicated. You do what your boss tells you. When you are the boss, it's very complicated. You don't know the right move, the right price, the right branding, the right client, the right salesperson. There's, there's lots of sides. So, um, having a clear vision of where you want to go will help illuminate the path for you. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I think, I think it was Alice in Wonderland where basically I think the, the I think it might be because the, the grinning cat in the tree asked Alice which way she, where she was headed. And um, because she didn't know that it was like, well, any road will get you there. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And so right. it's important if you know where you're going, then you can get the map to get there. Cool. Right. Um, wow. That has been uh amazing to chat with you and, and explore some of these things and it's really helped me think about some of the things that I've been struggling with as well. So thank you so much. Um, in terms of the podcast stuff, tell us what your ideal client is. Tell us, you know, what do you do for these people and how will they actually find you? You can find me at marksavantmedia.com. Mm -hmm. We are a good fit if you're a forward thinker, if you're a business owner, if you're, if you have a marketing budget and you're trying to find a way to really explode your media presence uh, I've got great options to help you launch and automate a podcast. That's, that's what I do. And then again, book club, you know, you can put a link below. I've got a book club. We're reading yeah. books, baby. We're reading books. This month we're doing Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, all-time bestseller. And um, yeah, if you want to surround yourself with the right people, read books, we'd love to have you. Oh, that's fantastic. So the website, just um, repeat that again for me. MarkSavantMedia.com. MarkSavantMedia.com. <laughs> Just like my name with media, marksavantmedia.com. I thought it was Sir Mark Savant, the great media.com. <laughs> that's just, just, just to the king and the queen. And that's, that's what they call me, but you know. <laughs> brilliant. Hey, look, Mark, I've, I've really, really enjoyed our talk, both um, online and offline. It's been brilliant. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, look oh, forward to pleasure. seeing you in your studio um, when it is all ready. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to see yeah. you there. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests.
I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my entrepreneur's playground and event centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.